My name is Eric Nelson and uh, my partner in crime is Bill Roth. Uh, we've been doing sensor stuff uh, for the last five years, I think, or six years. Um, and so we thought we'd come back to VMworld and uh, this is part of the code program. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about Intel Nooks. Uh, we're gonna do this in uh, 30 minutes, which normally this is an hour and a half. So I'm gonna go fast and, uh, and we'll do what we can do. How many of you guys are the experts that got a Nook from the... Yeah, all right, good. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the nook that we gave away to the experts. The idea behind it uh, was that, uh, you know, the Raspberry Pis are now $150, right? Because they're, you know, supply chain problems from uh, Asia. You can't get them. And uh, you can actually get a nook for $115 off of Alibaba direct from China. So that's what we did. And why, why are we doing nooks? Because you can run uh, Windows on it, you can run Tanzu on it, you can run vSphere on it. So we're like, if we're gonna give away gifts, why don't we give away something with a, you know, a decent Intel processor in it for the same price, so that's what we do it. This is a part of the code program. You can go to code.vmware.com and you can join the program. Um, we're just automation engineers, right? Or we're just people that like automation. Uh, I've always loved automation. I love uh, writing code. I like messing with stuff. And so code.vmware.com has 25,000 people in it. We have Slack channels that you can uh, engage with all the members. So it's free to join. Um, and again, we have 25,000 and we go to uh, Amazon reInvent and we sign developers up. So we have an amalgamation of different people on Slack channels. Uh, we have a blog, blogs.vmware.com slash code. Uh, and then we go around and we do hackathons. We do coding events. Um, and it's really focused on data center automation. Today's is just a fun thing to you know, do around sensors, Raspberry Pis. How many of you guys did the Raspberry Pi labs way back? Yeah, a lot, wow, okay, that, that's good. Well, today we're gonna talk about uh, the Nook. If I can, oops, of course. There we go. So um, let me read off the slide here. So what we did was we went and bought uh, Max Tang uh, N, uh, N6412s. Uh, they have a Celeron processor in them. Uh, Celeron is always a bad word, except the new Intel Celeron processor is fantastic, right? Uh, it's a four core um, system. I don't know, I think it runs at 3.0, but I'm not sure what gigahertz it runs at. But they're fast, they're fast. They have dual uh, HDMI 4K. Uh, on the back of it, so to do that, and you can run 60 frame a second 4K video on that guy, right? Uh, the cool thing about these machines is they have no fan, so no noise. So if you want to have a home system that's running vSphere, that's why we gave them to vExperts. You can put vSphere on them, you can get uh, 64 gig, uh, you can get 16 gig or 32 gig sims and put them in there, up to 64 gig guys have been doing. Uh, you can put uh, SSDs in them. Um, we have 256 gig SSDs that we are running these labs on. Uh, and then it has dual ethernet. Um, so again, a uh, really nice compact box. Uh, runs at about 120 degrees Fahrenheit, so no fan, but it does get warm. I tweeted out a picture of me cooking hot dogs on the fins because they, they do get warm. Um, and uh, they don't, they're more like a hot dog warmer, not a hot dog cooker, so be aware. Um, for this, we decided if we're gonna do sensors, why don't we do some Windows dev? How many of you guys have wrote code in Visual Studio? Couple? All right, that's good. So we decided it would be fun to actually put Tanzu on these guys, and Bill will talk about that. He'll talk about running vSphere on it. Um, he'll talk about how to run Tanzu on this, but then we thought it would be fun to also run Windows with Tanzu, because you can do that. You can put Windows on them, then run Tanzu on them. So we did that. We installed Windows. Uh, so this is just a link on where to go get Windows for free. Uh, you can go get Windows and then just run it for free if you want. Uh, you don't have to actually pay for that community license. They'll just bother you for it now till the end of the time, but that's fine. Um, you make a Windows installer and put it in the USB, make a USB installer, put it in a USB port, boot your Max Tang up and you will have Windows on that. Then you can go get Visual Studio, put the link to Visual Studio. Visual Studio is free from Microsoft. Um, as a community member, you can get the community edition, you can install it, so I put the link here. We installed that on the, on the machines uh, so that we could actually do labs um, with them for fun. Uh, and so we did that, and then what we needed to do for the Max Tang is it doesn't have an I2C 
or a GPIO bus on them because they're not a Raspberry Pi with all the pins. But there are uh, things that you can go get that will do that. So I will go to the next slide. So this is a, a, just a, a USB hub, right? But this USB hub actually comes with uh, I2C bus and four GPIO pins uh, on an eight pin header in the back of the unit, right? And so uh, we went and got those. Uh, and so there's a link to where you can go get those. And then they actually have a smart bar that is just basically a case with a, a header pin out that gives you lots of place to plug in all your wires and screw your sensors in. So we went and got those, and uh, that's what the prices are on those, so that we could do these labs on, uh, on an x86 machine and get sensor data from, uh, from your desktop. So that's what we did here. To be able to run this all together, uh, build a Tanzu app, uh, a couple of years ago we did this all running Kubernetes on Raspberry Pis. So now we're doing uh, Tanzu on x86 gear. And we try to keep all of this under you know, a couple $300 so you could do your home lab with this under a, it, with a reasonable price. So let's talk about Visual Studio. Um, Visual Studio, Community Edition, uh, again, a powerful IDE if you've never used it. The cool thing about Visual Studio now is they have an AI. So Raghu uh, was in a, a VMUG leadership meeting just uh, an hour ago, and he was talking about how code is starting to write itself. And if you've actually used the latest version of Visual Studio, they have an AI bit in it, and it really does help you write your code. So it's a lot of fun to use that. Uh, the Community Edition is free. You can go download it. Uh, when you download it, it'll ask you what compiler you're going to use. We just use C. This is just C code that we have in Visual Studio for our sensors. Um, so we downloaded that, select the C. They give you like 10 or 15 different modules, and it's really hard to figure out which module you actually want to get. And you can install it all, but you're going to install like 6 gig of compiler stuff. If you want to install 40 meg, you just click the C one, and away you go. I'm making up those numbers, but it's kind of proportional to that. Um, so we just installed on our Nook um, a small the C compiler, and then we, we get the IDE, and we started writing code. So before I jump into the, you know, a sample of the code, because I've only got 15, 20 minutes here, um, let's talk about sensors. So remember I said there's GPIO and I2C sensors. So most of you guys that have been through the Raspberry Pi session before had seen and heard this already, right? Um, GPIO is just general purpose IO. You, you have a ground, a power, and one pin. So this sensor here is a temperature sensor, temper and humidity, and it basically has one pin that's the digital out, and it has a one pin that's five volts and one pin that's ground. And that's all you hook up. And then when the, the data comes across, it comes across on that digital pin, the, the, the digital out, Voltage goes in, ground, of course, right? So that's a standard uh, GPIO. Another GPIO is the touch sensor. This, you just touch it, and it'll send uh, five volts down the digital out. I think it sends 1.5 volts. Anything over 1.2 volts is an on, right? So if you look at the curve of the line, if you have a scope, you can see the curve of the line, and on is when it hits 1.2 volts or higher. And so all this sensor does is when you press the button, it puts a 1.5 volt out on the digital line, and that's an on, right? The software will see that as a one. When you read it, it's a one. Zero is an off. So again, GPIO is very, that. This one actually will give you data down that single line. They pulse it, and then they, the driver reads the pulses. You don't need to know that other than it's a single GPIO. You can have just simple on and offs, or you can have pulses of on and off, which will then send some data. I2C bus, an I2C device is a bus that is a bus, like just a USB bus where you can daisy chain things. And each one of these devices has an IP address. I, uh, has not IP address, has a uh, device address, uh, usually a hex number up to 128. So uh, I think this one is, uh, I forget what, 77. So the device address for the BMP280, which has a bunch of data. It has uh, barometric pressure. It gives you temperature, barometric pressure, and altitude. So it's actually got an address. And the data and clock, the clock SCL is a clock signal. 
data signal and it's sending data and there's a device driver that has the address and it's talking to that device. So I2C devices are usually more complex. GPIOs are generally easier. Sensors, other ones, a photo sensor. Notice it has analog out or digital out. So analog is a curve, a value that's, you know, has a finite curve of voltage, and then your driver converts voltage to a data number versus digital out uh, is just a digital pulse. So it does a step function. It'll basically say from zero to 50 is this value, from 50 to 100 is this value, and you won't know what value that is between 50 and 100. So uh, analog will just give you the precise voltage, which your driver can then figure out exactly what that value is, parts per million. So if it's a gas sensor, it'll tell you parts per million, and that's usually an analog out. If you have digital, uh, it means it's gonna step function it and just tell you within a range. So that's kind of, these are sensors. My favorite is the motion sensor where you set that up and if you, anybody walks up to your desk, it'll know that it's walked up to your desk and it can talk to you or can you write, do an alarm or anything like that. So this is just a really quick through uh, what the sensors look like. Uh, I said there's smart bar, you know, for, for connecting to x86 through that hub. This is the internal of the smart bar and it just gives you GPIO lines and it gives you I2C lines and it labels them so you can actually connect those and then connect those into the hub, which then connects to your PC. Uh, we connected an OLED display uh, that displays my data. And uh, I'm going to show the code that we quickly wrote, and we wrote it in C, that uh, looks at the GPIOs, motion and touch, and then either says GPIO off or GPIO four on. So we've got it connected to four and to one. We're running that C code and we're getting that sensor data in and then displaying it all in Windows. So this is the code. I got to look at this. I can't really use a pointer here, uh, but I can say that we do some includes. Um, the, uh, the model C, the hot smart hub, comes with uh, some C code that allow you to talk to the GPIOs. Um, but all we're going to do here is include that code. Uh, this is a Windows app, so it says init API Windows. And notice here it says uh, no command show. That means when you run this app, it doesn't pop up a DOS window. If you want to actually see a DOS window, you would say you wouldn't have that. You would say you would set that no command to uh, a zero, and then you would actually see a pop up for the uh, for the window. Um, and you can set that in the compiler. So that's the difference between having a DOS window pop up when you run something and not when you're in uh, Visual Studio. Then we just come down, uh, and this is just my program. Uh, I'm going to GPO status 0x00. Zero zero zero. I don't think we use that for anything. Uh, we include some Model C init, which initializes the OLED display, and that's included in their library. You can go look at that code if you want to. Uh, we clear the display, so the display gets blacked. Um, the display is 128 by 64. Clearing it just sets zeros in all the bit positions in a buffer. And then you send that to display. Anywhere there's a zero, the bit goes off. Anywhere there's, there's a one, the bit goes on. These displays, the OLED displays, remember what the bit was. You don't, if you don't power cycle it, it remembers what it was last time. So if your app dies, the display still let up. Looks like it's still running. So, you know, you got that to play with. That's the same with the Raspberry Pi. Um, GPIO status, I say zero, zero, which says keep track of what the G, whether the GPIO is on or off. Then I just sit in a loop and I look, I do reads on the uh, read GPIO 1 and read GPIO 4. That's in the model C GPIO.C. You can go look at that function. It's like 20 lines of code that sends hex signals down to a, a chip called the FTDI chip, which is the chip that gives us the GPIOs. And so we read the touch sensor, we read the motion sensor, and then uh, there are graphics in display.c, there's some graphics functions, draw characters. So in this case, I say G, P, I, O, and a, 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 a escape for a, a parenthesis S. So a header for GPIOs. Then I just look and uh, draw GPO on or off, but I just, I just say O, I don't put the F there. Then I do the same thing for GPIO 4, which says G GPIO and then just a zero. 
Then I check to see is GPIO status zero, which means it's off. If GPIO one status zero is off, then I'm gonna just draw a, let's see, I'm gonna draw an N and then inverse it, which will take the, turn the on N off. And then I draw an F, reverse it, and then I draw finally an N. What that's doing is it's clearing wherever the F character is. I do that little trick twice to clear whatever was there before and then write off. If it was uh, else, it means it needs to draw, do that trick, and then put an N, and that's on. So off and on, and then that just sits in the loop. When I press those, those uh, sensors, this, or move in the, in the room, it'll be on and off. And so this is just a very quick, this is how we're building G, uh, sensors coming into your, your nook um, on your desktop. Then at the bottom I say display. Display says send that buffer down to the display. That's how we actually write that. So that's kind of a quick, very quick, here's the code in Visual Studio that I can then just go up and say build compile. It compiles, I get a .exe, I run it, and then the display will light up and it'll just sit, no command line, it'll just sit running the task manager and you can see it running. So that's my quick 15 minute pitch on how to do that for your nooks. I'll give it to Bill, and he can take you through how to run vSphere and Tanzu. Awesome, thanks very much. So for those of you with those awesome little Max tanks, I wanna, we did a couple of things uh, for this. And one, I also wanted to demystify, if you're used to sort of building standard applications, and what is all this container stuff about? I wanted to basically give kind of the crayon version of uh, what it is. Um, what I'm gonna do is tell you a little bit about Kubernetes uh, Community Edition, um, we'll, and then we'll also talk about what I took. So for those, I know I saw a bunch of hands being raised for those of you who got it. I, I'll, I'll give you the list of things to go through to get vSphere on one of these things. It's not as simple as you might think for a number of reasons. Um, uh, spoiler alert! It's that it's the USB fling came into came into play, um, and then we'll also talk about some of the sensor work uh, as well. So one of the first things that um, I did was actually attempt to put Tanzu Community Edition on this. Now you've probably heard a lot about the commercial editions. What is the Community Edition? Well, essentially, it's everything you get in the commercial edition but it's the sort of open source pieces. It's freely available. Um, actually to install it is relatively simple and you get a lot. So obviously there's Grafana and Prometheus. That's the tie in for this. Ah, I see you taking pictures. Thanks for reminding me. If you want copies of these slides quickly, just email broth at vmware.com. B-R-O-T-H at vmware.com. Or por mi gente uh, hispanohablante, B-R-O-T-H, arroba, bmware.com. I just wanted to say that because of the Spanish radio we get in my hometown. Just, you know. Anyway, so send those out. Just send me one line. Slides. We'll get you the slides for today. So um, you get a ton with it. And the tie-in today is... I've been, Eric and I have been doing sensor stuff. So I've had a weather station in my backyard as well as in my garage mapping the temperature gradient in my house. And I use Grafana and, and Prometheus to basically track this. So I now have like two or three years worth of temperature data so I can see seasonal um, temperature variations. And this is what I did during COVID. So, we also played with a bunch of other sensors um, that you can actually get, for those of you who want to do really complicated things, I built the world's most expensive grill thermometer. You can actually get a thermocouple and hook it up to a Raspberry Pi, and if your Wi-Fi coverage is enough, you can have, using Grafana, real-time graph of your barbecue temperature, so you know when to go outside, okay? Oh, also, latest project is you can get a Geiger tube on the internet. 
So I will be managing, I will be checking radiation levels in San Jose, California by using this. Now, your next question is, well, how are you going to test that? Google the words uranium glass. It's a real thing. You can get radioactive stuff in the mail, allegedly. So I haven't been visited by the National Security Agency yet, but we'll see. Um, anyway, we digress. So Tanzu Community Edition. .io. It's, uh, it's a great way to get started. And the way that I, um, here's how you basically get it installed. First of all, it's, I think a lot of these are pre-provisioned, unless you provisioned them with Linux. The one that I got was pre-provisioned with uh, Windows. First thing to do, I hate to admit it, I actually like it, but the Windows subsystem for Linux, I'm an Ubuntu head. So uh, install WSL on your Windows. Um, and then install Docker for Windows as your sort of main co uh, container. Um, there may be some licensing issues. I'm not sure uh, what's going on with that. And then what you want to do is pull a distro uh, that you like. I like the Windows, or I like the Ubuntu one. So basically pull that from the Windows store and then apply it. Now there's no really good, you, you Mac folks, you folks on fruit computers, you know, you have homebrew. We have to basically use chocolatey on Windows. So, but basically all of that is set up so that you can just type Choco install Tanzu Community Edition and uh, it'll just work. You do have to install Chocolatey first though. Set your path. If you want to be really brave, install a management cluster. Now, I think the one that I came with initially had four gig of memory, but I, had, I got it upgraded. So if you want to do anything with the management cluster, you're going to have to um, probably, for those of you that have one, you probably have to jack up your memory, but it's standard. Uh, the ones we gave the experts came with no memory, so they should just buy two. Buy DDR, buy, buy a couple of 16, uh, I think it's DDR for 2100 or something like that memory. Okay. Um, and also sort of like how to get the Tanzu world example. I've got a, we've got a URL here to basically just how do you get the sort of basics running. Again, if you need these slides with all these URLs, broth at vmware.com, that's me. One line, send slides, I'll send them to you. Now, okay, so Hello World isn't particularly interesting, so what I wanted to do is build an application. And I'm sorry that we can, we don't, we're not going in a ton of detail. Um, I have four minutes and 55 seconds. Um, but. I wanted to take an app that you could actually have sort of, uh, that you could spread across a three node cluster. So there's a little bit of code here in this URL, and I'll send you the slides if you ask, that actually gives you a really quick Python application, a Flask application, and it builds a complete web server application that delivers uh, pictures of cats, because that's what the internet is for. So basically you can run this, it'll run, and now you will have a fault tolerant website of cat pictures. Now I realize this may be essentially the highest achievement of our species. Um, so I'll let you sort of take it to the next step. So there's the Tanzu world, Tanzu uh, thing. Here's some, so as we um, end up on this, uh, let's see. Um, Oh, and I do have, did my slide for, ah, okay, so I will send you a different one and I'll give you the basics. My slide on how to get uh, VMware on here did not make it. All right, so I'll update that when you ask for the slides. I attempted, for those of you that have one of these, I started out because I don't, I don't like beta software, even our own beta software even though some of the folks who build it are on the same floor as I am. But um, I took Windows, or sorry, uh, these were 7 0 U 3 G. Uh, basically, burn a CD. I had to get a CD with a, a USB CD uh, on there to basically load up the CD. Now, one of the problems you're gonna have is that it uses the Realtek, the, the, the box uses the Realtek chips, and those aren't supported anymore. So in this, I will uh, post also, uh, there's a fling for a USB 
network driver, so USB to, to RJ45. So you, there's probably 20 different of those that are approved. Buy one of those, you need that uh, fling under 7.0. Now the fling for the USB driver apparently has been integrated into 8.0. So uh, it is alleged by Mr. Lamb himself. Uh, then, uh, once you get that loaded up, uh, you may have a little bit of funkiness with the network. Uh, so in vCenter, you basically have to t um, twiddle some of the network settings just briefly to get your, uh, to basically establish the route between your network and the actual uh, virtual network. So that'll be in the slides uh, when I send you uh, that. So that's, those are the key things. One, watch out for USB, and then there is a way around the networking thing. Broth at VMware.com. Email me and I'll tell you what it is or if you run into problems. I got, in, I got into most of them. And as Eric said, it does get pretty hot. So for those of you in the northern climates, you can use it as a space heater. It's probably too hot for a foot warmer because I took my fancy grill thermometer and that said it was about 121 degrees Fahrenheit. So it, the, 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 thing, the fanless stuff does get hot, but it doesn't seem to have broken yet. So here's the kind of information that you can get. Obviously, code.vmware.com. Code, code There'll be copies of the slides, I believe, here, uh, certainly from our US presentations at livecopper.com slash downloads. Interesting, if you want to get started on all of the stuff that Eric was talking about, I recommend basic GPIO labs for just you know, how to read if a pin is on or off. I2C, if you want to get those fancy sensors that have data. Uh, if you go to code.com, about five years ago, I wrote one on the BMP280, which gives you uh, temperature and humidity. And this will give you kind of a, a background on how you can actually pull numbers off these chips. And then also some really funky sensors out there that you can get, including uh, Geiger tubes. So send it to Eric, send the info to Eric, or uh, me if you have questions. So with 24 seconds left, thanks very much uh, for your time.